I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we begin our investigation into one of the most enduring mysteries in the history of true crime, the disappearance of Maura Murray. Everybody and welcome to another episode of the Prosecutors Podcast. I'm Brett, and I am joined today, as always, with my co-host Alice. I'm Alice. Good to see you guys again, or hear from you guys. Yeah, it's good to be with you as well, Alice. I think, and I don't want to jinx it, but we have no new disasters to report at the beginning of today's podcast. So, but we continue, but we continue to be in our separate uh, shelter-in-place places. Are you still under a blanket, or what's going on with you? I am not under a blanket today. I have, I have added some soundproofing, so hopefully that'll take care of itself without the need for a blanket. But your house is not is still somewhat open to the elements. Well, so. The tree is no longer in my house, and we've done some basic repairs to keep the rain also out of the house. Uh, and our insurance guy should be by tomorrow or the next day to sort of tell us what they're going to pay for. Hopefully everything, but we'll see. Uh, and then we can start, we can start rebuilding. Ah, what, what a thing to go through. I'm really sorry you had to go through this, but you know what? Your commitment to recording this podcast, despite really having like every natural disaster hit has been, um, Nothing short of admirable. And it's interesting, you know, for the audience, hopefully you guys are listening to this well after the coronavirus has passed and the my roof is rebuilt. You know, we were trying to record a few episodes ahead of time so that, you know, we, we can uh, maintain our schedule. Uh, so, so I think of these as sort of a, a nice historical record of everything, all the crazy things going on in our lives as we begin our podcasting journey. It's a podcast diary of sorts. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe they'll make a movie out of it one day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so today great. we're going to start our investigation into the disappearance of Maura Murray. Uh, I doubt anyone who's listening to this podcast has not heard of Maura Murray. Uh, we're going to do the full story. You know, we'll lay down the background for you in case you haven't. But I would say in the true crime community, Maura Murray is... Definitely one of the most famous cases. It's one of the cases that people talk about the most. Uh, it is also one of the most controversial cases. And it reminds me, you know, Alice, do you feel like people never really grow up? All the time. Especially when there's like a big event that, you, that, you know, defines uh, that period of your life. Yeah. And I just, you know, I don't know what it is about this case, but it really brings out the high school and people, you know, this case is, it's hard to even do research on this case because there's so much fighting back and forth between people. We talk about the true crime community a lot. Well, there is a Maura Murray specific community and it's very vocal and it's very divided and the, everybody in the community hates each other. It's a toxic environment frankly. Um, and you know what I, you're, I mean, I don't know about the toxicity, but I have noticed that people kind of view their own lives through the lens of Maura Murray. So they like project their life onto Maura Murray. I think because maybe there's so many open-ended questions about what happened. So they're like, well, this is my experience. So that must have been what happened to Maura Murray. That is so true. And people, people who've never met Maura Murray are incredibly defensive of her. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really remarkable, and you know we're going to talk about this case, and this is going to be a multi-part show. There's no way you can cover Maura Murray in one episode. You probably can't cover it in two. We're not going to do anywhere near the depth uh, that you can find. There's a podcast, a famous podcast about Maura Murray called Missing Maura Murray, 
if you're if you listen to our podcast and you find this to be a fascinating case i advise you to go listen to that they're on episode 100 at this point so they there's nothing about more murray they have not talked about uh, we're not going to be able to do all that. Uh, and the other thing we're going to try and avoid is the high school drama that surrounds this case. Um, you know, there's a couple names you can't talk about more Murray without mentioning. James Renner is one of them. He wrote a book called True Crime Addict, uh, which is about his investigation of the Maura Murray case and sort of also about his own life and the things that were going on in his life. People have very strong opinions about uh, Mr. Renner. Um, you know, my personal opinion, I think he's done a lot for this case. He's done a lot of great investigating. He's brought to light a lot of evidence. Um, he certainly shined a light on this case. I don't really agree with a lot of his, his conclusions about it, um, but, you know, I have no reason to think he's a bad person. That in of itself is a controversial view. And there are many people who hate James Renner. We are not getting into whether James Renner is a good guy or a bad guy. So, Brett, you, you clearly know a lot about Maura Murray. What got you interested in it? Um, you've been in true crime for a long time. Was it near the beginning, middle, or, you know, present Honestly, day? Honestly, your... it was James Renner's book. I read huh. True Crime Addict um, many, well, I guess right after it came out. So... You know, I had heard about Maura Murray, but I had never really dived into the case. Um, and then and then I was reading, I was reading a lot of different books on true crime. Uh, and I saw that book and I thought, well, this seems interesting. He's a great writer. He's a fantastic writer. Um, it's a really good book. I advise anybody to read it, whether you're into Maura Murray or not. Uh, and he's right. I mean, the subtitle of the book is something like How I Lost Myself in the Maura Murray Case. And he talks about how... If you start looking at this case, you, you risk becoming obsessed. Uh, and so after I read that book, I started listening to Lance and Tim's podcast, Missing Maura Murray. Uh, and frankly, if you listen to, you know, a hundred episodes of a podcast, you're going to know a lot about a case. Uh, that's how I came to know about Aaron Larkin, who was another person who is both famous and incredibly controversial. Her, or she and uh, James Renner, have a death. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the word what the word I'm looking for is. The, they are they are engaged in a death struggle over this case. Um, I think if if they could murder each other, they probably would. But <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna get involved in that. Uh, if you want to listen to Aaron Larkin's podcast, it's 107 degrees. She has her own views. She is very close to the Murray family, which. If you get into more Murray, you begin to understand that the Murray family has their own views and their own things going on. I'm just putting that out there so everybody knows it's out there. If you want to look into all that stuff, feel free. But we, we're going to avoid it. One way of looking at this is, okay, we've told you that there are books written about this. There are 100 plus episode podcasts about Maura Murray. So what can we possibly have to offer here? And this is just a reminder, you know, hearkening back to our first episode. I'll, there are a lot of views, a lot of people viewing Maura Murray through their own experience in life. And we are trying to look at it again as prosecutors, as um people who are rooted in certain principles in the law and um, the rules of evidence. And not to say we're going to look at this completely cold-heartedly, but I do think that is something we can add here. So we do hope you guys can enjoy that. I think that's right, Alice. That's what we're going to try and do here. We're going to try and avoid the drama. We're going to try and avoid the accusations that fly back and forth between people who were involved in this case but didn't become involved in it until a decade after Maura Murray disappeared. We're going to avoid all that. We're just going to look at the evidence we have. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to try and give you our best view of what probably happened uh, and, and what the resolution of this, this case is. Um, and if that excites you and you, you learn about this case, you want to know more, as we've said, there's a ton of stuff out there. So we're not going to try and cover everything, but we are going to try and keep it tight talk about the things that matter, um, explain to the best we can some of the things that people focus on, and then offer our own views. And, you know, I have, I have my view of what happened in the Maura Murray case changes often. Uh, I came into this thinking about this podcast and talking about this 
with Alice thinking I was going to say one thing. I think I'm going to say a slightly different thing now. That's going to happen. Uh, you know, we, we did the Elisa Lamb ca case, and we talked about how there's just enough evidence there that you can create a lot of different scenarios. It's the same thing with Maura Murray. And you, you see that in the community, and you see that with the different uh, theories that people have about what happened to her. So I think the best place to start off is from the beginning. Talk about uh, what happened on February 9th, 2004, to begin this, uh, this incredible mystery. So this is a case with twists and turns and surprising revelations. It's a case that appears simple at first and just gets more and more complicated. It is a case with more rabbit holes than Alice in Wonderland. But let's start in the beginning. So on February 9th, 2004, Maura Murray drove her 1996 Saturn to New Hampshire for what appears to be a short stay in the White Mountains. It was an area that she was very familiar with. On an icy bend in the road, she lost control and crashed into a snowbank. Several neighbors and a passerby saw her and even spoke to her. Ten minutes after she crashes her car, Maura is gone. And she's never been seen again. So, you know, it's interesting. And you guys are going to get a taste of this. These, you know, long podcasts and books are all written essentially about 10 minutes of time. In which time Maura disappears off the face of the planet. And we're going to talk about that, uh, that timeline a little bit later. And just how little time there was for this disappearance to occur. So I think to understand those 10 minutes, um, we should back up just a little bit to give you um, a view of who Mora is. So we're going to try to fly through this quickly. Like we said, we could spend, you know, years on this, but we'll, we'll cut to the chase. So Mora growing up um, was, as described by her own dad, who uh, is, his name is Fred Murray. Um, she is really an all-American girl. Um, you know, growing up, she was a star runner in high school. She won awards and broke records uh, in track. And when she graduated high school, uh, she actually followed in the footsteps of her older sister at West Point, which um, you may know is a military academy for the United States Army. And when you think about it, at that point in her life, she really is, you know, the all-American girl. You know, she's, she comes from the supportive family, this very successful family. She's successful herself. She's going off to the United States Military Academy. And anybody who knows anything about West Point knows just how difficult it is to get into that school, how, how, you know, how much confidence you have to have in yourself and how much accomplishment you already have to have. You have to get the support of your senator to go to West Point. So it's a big deal. You get this letter of recommendation from a U.S. senator to say that you should go to West Point. Um, and to have two, um, uh, two sisters uh, go to West Point is also a really big deal. So, so far, she is just rocking life, winning awards, breaking records on her way to West Point. But then something changed. While she was on a training exercise at Fort Knox, which if you know anything about Fort Knox, I mean, it's very uh, secure. Uh, it's well protected. There's good security. Mora does something seemingly a little silly. She steals less than five dollars of makeup from the commissary. Um, and you know, just a little bit of background. Mora's family is not hard. You know, hard hit for money or anything. Five dollars should be nothing. Um, and to steal makeup. And she had the money to pay for it, which is something that you know we learn later. I mean, this was not. I mean, number one, it's it's five dollars worth of makeup. Number two, she had the money to cover it. And number three, it, it's just I, I have to pause here for a second. Stealing from Fort Knox is amazing. <laughs> I, I mean, it, the the guts that it takes to steal from the place that is literally a cliche about how hard it is to steal from is something else. I don't, I don't even really know what to say about it. And you know, I've never been at West Point, but my guess is. They probably can't wear makeup or a lot of makeup much of the time. So again, this is kind of like a silly, silly offense. You know, of all things, why steal makeup? Five dollars worth of that. I don't even know what you could buy for five dollars, to be honest. I know this is, you know, a couple decades ago, but you can barely buy like 
a stick of eyeliner for five bucks. So that's, and it's going to be cheap makeup if it's five bucks, <laughs> um, not something nice like Estee Lauder. Um, so anyways, um, totally understandably, she faces disciplinary proceedings for stealing from the commissary. Um, and her own sister is going to testify, or she, her sister testifies um, at this proceeding that Mora just made a mistake. Yeah, and it's, you know, her, her family... Maura's family has been, and it's frustrating to a lot of people in the in the community, have been fairly reticent to talk about the things that have happened to her over the years. But her sister recently has elaborated on this a little bit and said that, in her view, it was one of those things where, you know, you put something in your pocket and you forget about it, uh, and that that was what happened here. You know, I think if, if we didn't necessarily know some of the other stuff that's going to happen and we're going to talk about, maybe you would you would believe that. I'm sure her sister believed it at the time. Uh, but that that was the reason that or that was what Mora told her. Yeah. And it sounds understandable. Again, five bucks. But this next thing, I think, sheds a little bit light on the, the commissary stealing. So after two years at West Point, Maura actually leaves West Point to go to school at Amherst on um, a track scholarship. Um, remember, she was a star runner back in high school. Okay, I just said Amherst, but my understanding is people who go to Amherst actually call it Amherst. So I think I may have pronounced it wrong. <laughs> Do you have any insight on this? Is it Amherst or Amherst? You know, the thing about Massachusetts is they, they pronounce everything weird. I lived in Massachusetts for a little while, so reading is Redding and Worcester. And Worcester. Yeah, they got Worcester. What's what's there's another one that's that's equally weird. So yeah, I think you're right. I think they do pronounce it that way, which is I not think people the who go there, it. it's Amherst. So sorry yeah. if I offended anyone for saying Amherst earlier. <laughs> Anyways, we're, get, we're getting sidetracked. So she goes to Amherst, which is a fantastic school, by the way. Um, you know, very academically strong. And, you know, clearly she's there on a track scholarship, uh, all the more impressive. And while she's at Amherst, Mora's arrested this time for using a stolen credit card number to order hundreds of dollars of food from a local restaurant. Again, somewhat bizarre. Uh, she has her own money, uh, is not hungry for food from what we can tell. Uh, and uh, for this offense, she was given probation with three months of supervision. So she doesn't, you know, go to jail or anything for it, but she is given probation. And the more you learn about this case, you return to this event a lot because depending on your theory of what happened uh, when Maura disappeared, this may or may not be significant. One thing I think we, we can point to for sure there's something going on with her. Um, you know, the first incident of shoplifting, maybe you can say is just a mistake. This is obviously more serious. Now, look, sometimes I think we overstate these things. I mean, I think sometimes people are just stupid and they're not thinking. I remember, and I, and I don't know, I don't know if it says anything about you, about how you react to this. I remember when I was in college, I had a friend and one day, this was when I was a freshman and, and we lived in the same dorm, and one day he comes by and he's all excited because he and his friends had gone to an ATM. And this was back, you know, now when you go to the ATM and you put your card in, it will not give you the money before the card comes out. And the reason they did that is because people kept forgetting their card. They'd get the money and they'd leave and the card would be sticking there in the slot. Anyway, so they had one of those situations where they show up, there's a card sticking out of the slot. And they take it to the local CVS and buy a bunch of beer with it. And this guy was so excited because they had this card. And he's like, hey, we can you know, buy whatever we want. And I was just horrified. I thought, what are you doing? You, know, like, you realize you're <laughs> stealing doing that. You know, there's somebody whose money you're using to buy stuff for yourself. And this person, I don't think was a bad person. I admit I didn't really spend a lot of time with him after this because I, because I just thought this was terrible. But anyway... Um, but I don't think they were a bad person. I think they just didn't really even think about this fact. Almost like picking up a $20 on the street and using that $20 as opposed to what we think of like identity theft these days. Right, exactly. Um, and I would like to think if it happened now, they wouldn't do that because they would think about it more. Um, and so it's possible this was actually around the same time, a little bit before this incident with Maura Murray. So it's possible to say to yourself, well, she's just a dumb college kid. Uh, she just wasn't thinking. 
but there's definitely some escalation here, right? We're going from five bucks uh, to several, a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, this is multiple times she's ordering from this local, uh, I think it's a pizza place or a sub place. I forget exactly what it is. Um, people read a lot into this. Apparently when she would buy this food, and one of the reasons it got flagged is she would buy a lot of it. She would buy way more food than one person could eat. So some people say that she had bulimia, and this is evidence of her bulimia, and she would buy, you know, a whole pizza and eat the whole pizza herself and then throw up or whatever and then eat like another pizza or whatever. You know, I don't know if that's reading too much into it. I don't know if really she was just buying food for her friends, uh, kind of like this guy. I mean, it was him and his buddies buying a bunch of beer. If one of them had gotten arrested, you could have said, man, that's a lot of beer for one person. And it was because he was buying it for everybody else, too. So I don't know exactly here what's going on. And, and that's something that we don't have a lot of clarity on. Um, I will say this. One of, one of the most striking things in this case is a photograph that was taken the night that Mora was arrested. Basically, the police executed a sting on her. They waited till she ordered this food again. Um, and then they delivered the food to her. And when she took it, they arrested her. And the photos that we're going to put up on the website, and you can see this, one of them is Mora in her West Point uniform. And the other one is her, essentially her mugshot. She wasn't arrested. She was just apprehended or whatever. And they took a photo of her up against the wall of her dorm. And the difference between those two photos is just utterly striking to the point where people have become obsessed with this photo. Uh, people have drawn all sorts of conclusions based on this photo. One podcast I listened to, the guy talks about how he had nightmares after seeing this photo, which I think is <laughs> a little bit extreme. Uh, another podcast said that she looks like a scorpion in this uh, photo, like a real, I mean, she, and she does. She looks like a hardened criminal in this photograph. And people have drawn all sorts of conclusions that she's a psychopath from, from this photograph alone. Uh, and I think even James Renner does that a little bit, that looks at this photo and thinks, man, there is something wrong with this person. I don't know, Alice, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, not a fair comparison because her West Point photo, obviously you're dressed in uniform and your hair is pulled back and there's a, you know, a certain way you have to look at West Point and it's a picture day. Whereas if you're arrested when you're in your dorm room thinking you're just getting some pizzas and I would assume it's highly embarrassing to have the cops, you know, break in on you, catch you in the middle of stealing. I probably wouldn't look great either. So I, I don't think it's quite a fair comparison when people draw the stark contrast between her West Point photo and her um, uh, her mugshot, essentially, in her dorm room. It's kind of like a an Us Weekly or tabloid magazine comparing a red carpet picture of some celebrity and the way they look taking out their trash, <laughs> which... I think all of us know there's a big difference between those two. So I personally don't read that much into the um, the mugshot in the dorm room because I know that when I'm caught unawares, I probably don't look my best either. Um, and we do have the West Point photo, which is kind of the best you look because uh, you're prepared for that photo. And Alice, that is such a good comparison with the celebrity comparison because Maura Murray is a celebrity in the true crime world. So it's not surprising that people have essentially treated her the way tabloids treat uh, famous people, uh, both in comparing these photos and just the way people pick apart every aspect of her life um, to try and, you know, uncover the secret scandal behind Maura Murray. So I think that's a really good way to describe it. Yeah, and putting on all, the, you know, I know we've already said this, but putting into perspective, she's what, about 20 at an elite um, uh, liberal arts college with a family who is successful, you know, a sister who's at West Point. And um, by all accounts, she is supposed to look a certain way. And here she is caught ordering a ton of pizzas on a stolen credit card. I mean, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I don't know how she's feeling, but that's not great. And we're going to return to this incident and the West Point incident later on uh, when we start sort of digging into this case and the theories about this case. But for now, we just we wanted to give you a sort of idea of what was going on with Moore Murray in the run up to the few days where it seems as though everything kind of fell apart for her. You know, you have this person, as Alice said, who is the all-American girl. When it's high school, everything's going great for her. Uh, she's on top of the world. She goes to West Point. You know, from what her sister said, she didn't really enjoy West Point very much. 
it wasn't really what she was looking for. Her sister, apparently, West Point was perfect. It was perfect for her personality. It was perfect for the kind of person she was and the way she was wired. And for Mora, it really wasn't. And her sister said that, you know, she would find her crying in her dorm room. And then she was pretty miserable. And the reason she left after two years was not the, um, the shoplifting incident, apparently, that either didn't end her career or had not been resolved yet. It's a little, I'm a little unclear about that. But at the conclusion of two years at West Point, you have to make a decision. Are you going to go into the military or not? And West Point, understanding that people are going to go to West Point and it's not going to be for them, allows you to leave after two years with no commitment, no military commitment, and, and no you know black mark on you. And so at that point, she decided she did not want to pursue a military career. And so she does go to Amherst. Uh, where she's in, she's in nursing and she's running track. And you kind of could imagine she went through this difficult time in West Point, but she's kind of back in her comfort zone. You know, she's a good student. She's taking a very difficult, rigorous uh, nursing um, degree. Apparently, uh, this is one of the best places to get that degree. She's back running, which is what she loved to do and she was passionate about. Uh, and then this thing happens with a credit card. And you sort of wonder what's going on there and what does it mean? And, and like I said, we'll talk about it more as we go on. But just remember all of that, all of that background as we talk about the next few days. Great. Uh, so now we're in February 2004. And remember, Maura disappeared on February 9th. So we're going to go now to February 6, 2004. Now recall... Mara is going to go missing on February 9th. So this is only three, four days before she goes missing. And I think it's difficult to think about this case without thinking about what was happening in her life at that time. That in of itself is controversial. And we'll talk about that later. And we'd like to point out, you know, if you pick out any three days in any of our lives, um, they all may seem inc inconsequential. And a lot of what's happening here, some of it might seem a little strange. But the only reason people have focused on these things and really picked them out is because she ends up disappearing. So, um, we, you know, I just caution you a little bit because some of these things may have been a little out of the ordinary, but could happen to anyone. But the reason they're spotlighted is because they directly precede her disappearing. And I think it's worth dwelling on this point that Alice has raised for just a second, because people think of life like it's a movie. So the old, I think it's checkoff line, you know, if there's a gun in the first act, it has to go off at some point in the play. Uh, life's not like that. There are guns in the first act all the time that never go off. And it's really easy to look back from Maura's disappearance and assume that this is all one storyline leading up to that disappearance. I think that's possible. I think it's worth it to think about it that way because I think there's definitely the, a possibility that that's true. But the other possibility, like Alice said, we are looking at these things and, and investing them with so much significance because of what happens to Maura later on, they may have nothing to do with that. And the family's view of this is that people waste their time thinking about all this stuff, that none of this matters. And, and that's another point, right, is that um, obviously this is a cold case. We don't know ultimately what happens. And so we kind of throw in the kitchen sink. We're telling you everything because we don't know what's significant per se. Um, we don't want to be the ones to choose and pick. And, you know, when we take a case to trial, uh, at the end, before you actually try a case, you try to weed out the insignificant facts. But sometimes when you're not totally sure what the ultimate outcome is, you may throw in some extraneous facts in case they become relevant later. So we're giving you way more than may, may actually fit into the story. Um, and I think if you try to weave one storyline through all of them, you won't be successful because like Brett said, maybe a lot of it fits into the story, maybe none of it, maybe some of it. Um, but to say all of it fits directly into a scene by scene, I think is just not realistic. And Alice, wouldn't you say one of the most difficult things when you're dealing with a complex case is weeding out what is extraneous and what doesn't really matter to the rest of the facts? Oh, absolutely. I think you see this especially, you know, Brett and I have dealt with cases where you have lots of recorded phone calls, like hundreds of hours of phone calls. And to weed it down to like the most important minutes out of hundreds and maybe 
thousands of hours of phone calls is so difficult, especially when you're trying to tell the story that you are not the author of. And even prosecutors on the same prosecution team will look at evidence and one person will think this is the mo this is the gotcha, this is the smoking gun, this is incredibly significant, and everybody else looks at it and says, yeah, I don't see it at all. I don't understand why you think that's important at all. Uh, and that's in a case where you've sort of got all the facts marshaled. Um, very different situation from what we faced with Moore Murray. Yeah, absolutely. I will say there are so many times when I get an email from like an agent or a co-counsel with like some attachment of some piece of evidence and just the word like boom or gotcha in the subject line with no other text. And I always have to write back and say like, so why is it significant to you? <laughs> I know. And that's always so embarrassing because you want to get it. You want to see it and be like, oh, yeah, man. Wow. Let's go to grand jury tomorrow, you know? Right. I'm like, <laughs> and usually when they tell me what it is, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that too. <laughs> just wanted to make sure. I just sure. wanted to make sure that was the only thing you were referring to. <laughs> right. And I think that goes with this Maura Murray case as well. So it's Thursday, February 6th, 2004. Seven o'clock that night, Maura reports to work at the security center for one of the dorms. So basically Maura had a job where she sat you know, at the entrance of the dorms and she checked IDs to make sure that no one untoward, I guess, was visiting the dorms. Um, I don't even know if they still do this. I know when I was in college, we had, you know, guys dorms and girls dorms and nobody cared who went into the guys dorms, but the girls dorms were like, well, they were like Fort Knox and you could not go into those dorms basically at all if you were a guy. And they had people who sat at the entrance and checked all these IDs. Are you revealing your age now, Brett? <laughs> no, well, I'm I'm know. kidding because I actually I feel old. my I, that was similar to my college experience, uh, except like wi girl women lived on certain floors and men lived on other floors. Um, they were allowed on each other's floors, but what I heard most recently, like in the last year, that same dorm that I lived in, now it's completely mixed, so you could live next door to you know the other sex. Um, so even in my I'm not that young, but even in, since the time I went to college, that has changed significantly. So I lived in a dorm in law school, and it was completely mixed, um, but there was only one bathroom on each floor, and each floor had you know either a male bathroom or a female bathroom. So my floor had a women's bathroom, and so if you wanted to go take a shower or whatever, you always had to like go out of the dorm, go up the stairs to the floor above you. Uh, and take a shower. So that was that was not fun. Interesting. <laughs> so she she reports to her job, uh, and you know her job is to check IDs. So at seven seventeen, she calls her boyfriend Billy Roush, uh, another incredibly controversial figure for reasons that have nothing to do with this case, and we're not going to discuss. You can find out all about that elsewhere. Uh, but she calls him. Call lasts about twenty minutes. At 9.56 p.m., she again calls her boyfriend, Billy. Uh, this phone call lasts for about six minutes. At 10.10, she receives a call from her older sister, Kathleen. This call lasts about 28 minutes. At 12.07 a.m., Maura calls her boyfriend again and speaks to him for seven minutes. So then... At around 1 a.m., between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., the morning of Friday, February 7th, Mara's supervisor... Can I just say real quick, sure. the, the constant calls to the boyfriend, I just have to say, having been a college girl with a boyfriend, if my job was sitting somewhere waiting for people to just check in, I'd probably be on the phone with my boyfriend all night, too. Like, calling, you know, like, oh, and I remembered this thing, and then talk for a while and hang up and call back. Um, just from my own experience, I could see me doing And it's that. even worse for Mara because her boyfriend is in Oklahoma at the time. Her boyfriend, Billy, she actually met at West Point. I think he was either a junior or a senior when she was a freshman. Um, so she met him there and they started dating. He graduated and was assigned to Fort Sill in Oklahoma. So they were a pretty good ways away from each other. So I am sure they talked on the phone all the time. One thing that's significant about that is, you know, and you see this in a lot of cases and you see this in the Moore Murray case 
all the time, uh, particularly from certain corners of the case, people will point to the rules uh, and they'll, they'll act as if because the rule said X, X must have happened, right? And you see that a lot here. Well, one of the rules was Mara was not supposed to be on the phone uh, while she was working her job. The, I don't know why they had this rule, but one of the rules was no cell phones while you're at the security desk. So Mara is pretty clearly ignoring that rule. I don't think that says anything about her character. I would ignore that rule too, uh, but I do think it becomes important later on when we talk about stuff like that. So it's 1 a.m., it's 1.30 a.m., and the first really weird thing in this case happens. Mara's supervisor, Karen, hears, someone tells her, it's not exactly clear how she hears this, that Mara was at her workstation, but she was in tears. So Karen, being the good supervisor she is, decides to go check on Mara and see if she's okay, and found her in what she described as a catatonic state. Mara was staring straight ahead, and students were coming into the building. She wasn't checking their IDs. It was as if she didn't even see them there. Um, so Karen decides whatever's going on with Mara, she can't do her job. And she decides she's going to relieve her of her duties. She was so distraught, she couldn't even sign herself out of work. So Karen signed her out for her and helped her gather her nursing books and the other things she had on her desk. Uh, Mara was sobbing uncontrollably. And when Karen asked her what's wrong, all she could say, apparently, was my sister. And she pointed to her cell phone. That's all she could say. And we know that Maura talked to her sister earlier, right? And we do know that Maura talked to her sister earlier. And what we know now that we did not know for a very long time, and I think this speaks to some of the reticence of the family to be as open with the true crime community and the public as some people think they should be, uh, particularly James Renner. He can't talk about this case very long without going back to James Renner. Um, her sister Kathleen said that when she talked to her, when she talked to Murray, that she had just been discharged from a rehab facility. She'd gone to rehab for some alcohol addiction. Uh, but that literally that evening on the way home, her and her then husband stopped at a liquor store. Uh, and that she had started drinking again. And she speculated uh, that, that Maura, and I think it was more in speculation, I think she knew from the phone call, that Maura was very upset about this. She was upset with her. She was upset that her sister was drinking. That is one possible explanation for what's going on with Maura. Now, one weird thing about it is, once again, that phone call was at 10.10 p.m. In between that call... And when the supervisor found her, number one, three hours have passed. Number two, she has actually talked to her boyfriend on the phone, albeit only for seven minutes. So people have questioned whether Maura's state that she was in when Karen found her was actually related to that, or if Maura, not wanting to address the real issue, but having legitimately been upset by that, sort of referred to that to cover for whatever it was that was going on with her. So what did Karen do at this point? Karen was, so Karen was so concerned about Maura that she actually initially insisted uh, on taking her to the campus counseling center. Maura did not want to do that. She rejected any kind of counseling. Uh, and instead she told Karen it would be okay because her roommate at her dorm room could keep her company and she would be fine. Under that understanding, Karen actually accompanies her all the way back to the dorm room to make sure, or to the dorm, to make sure she gets there okay. And then only leaves once Maura assures her, it's okay, my roommate, you know, she's there, she'll take care of me. Turns out, Maura lived alone. She did not have a roommate. So Mara clearly did not want anyone coming with her. She didn't want to talk to anyone because she rejects the counseling center. Um, everything Karen does, by the way, it sounds really reasonable. If I was supervising someone and they were acting like that, I'd probably be pretty concerned too. Yeah, I think Karen handles this exactly the way she should have. I mean, at the end of the day, she couldn't force Mora to get help. Uh, but, you know, she, she tried to take care of her as best she could. She let her go home. 
yeah, I mean, I, I think and I think Karen comes off well in this story, and I don't. Most people, I don't think, blame Karen too much for how she handled it, though. This is once again, this case involves a lot of toxicity, and there are people who somehow blame Karen and claim Karen should have done more. I don't think you can say that. It's easy to say, you know, with hindsight. You know, I was, uh, I don't know, um, Karen's situation, like if she's a student or not, but I was a peer counselor in college, which just meant that we were, we kind of got some, uh, I guess, guidance on how to counsel our peers when they were in states like this, uh, that they can, you know, every dorm kind of had a few peer counselors, the idea that students would be more willing to talk to other students than say a counselor or a professor. And everything she does, I mean, that's exactly kind of by the book what we were counseled to do. You can't force someone to get help. You're there for them. You ask all the questions and you offer help. But at the end of the day, like she, she more gets to make her own decision. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. Um, Maura, you know, Maura's a grown woman at this point. She can do what she wants. So there is a strange coincidence, and we're going to come back to this when we talk more about theories, but I'm going to go ahead and lay out the facts for you now. Uh, something that also happened that night, less than a mile from where Maura was working. There was a student named Patrit Vassi, and around 12.20 a.m. that night, which would have been shortly after Maura got off the phone with her boyfriend, Billy, Police responded to an accident scene uh, at the intersection of Triangle and Mattoon Streets, which is a crossing street near campus, like I said, about 0.9 miles from where Mora was mur was Maura, from where Mora from where Mora was working. Um, now the initial call had been that there was a person passed out on the side of the road, uh, but once the police arrived, it was evidence it was evident that what they had was a hit and run. Uh, now, Patrie was very injured. He was actually in a coma for quite some time. The driver who hit him never stopped. Turned out that Patrie had had a lot to drink that night, uh, and that, in addition to the automobile accident itself, he didn't recall any details of what happened. Couldn't remember it at all. There were no witnesses. There was no video. Uh, the police, you know, recorded this as a, a hit and run and really, I think, essentially waited for Patrit to wake up from his coma in the hopes that he could tell them what happened. Because this happened so close to where Mora was on the night when she had this incident, uh, a lot of people have done a lot of investigation to try and tie these two things together. When we talk about theories later on, we'll tell you about some of the evidence that's been brought together. Uh, just you know, to, to give you some foreshadowing, most people think that based on the evidence the police recovered, uh, particularly about paint and other things with Patrit, that Mara was not involved in this. And I'd like to cut in also, I mean, you know, we're, we're laying this out for you because it is close in time. I think it's worth noting, but just looking at the timeline, uh, you know, if she gets off the phone with her boyfriend at 12, 14, this accident happens at 1220 and she's reported as being in tears at 1230. I know this is only 0.9 miles away, but four minutes to get into a car, hit someone and, you know, be back at your seat within 10 minutes is a pretty short timeline. So we just throw that out there, not because we are, like we said, kind of throwing in the kitchen sink for all of you guys, but um, just because we're throwing in the kitchen sink doesn't mean we're necessarily saying this had something to do with the story. Later on, I'm going to make the argument that she was involved, but okay. <laughs> what Alice says is There you true. go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's like super suspect, but. It, it, people, you know, <laughs> if you go online, people have lost years of their lives to the Patrit Vassy angle to this. And poor Patrit Here, Vassy. Here's what I actually think. I think she's on the phone in the car. I think that's possible. Yeah. And, because then you're not really paying attention. You right. Know? And we're getting ahead of ourselves, but one of the things people use about this case to say that she couldn't have hit Patrice Vassy was yeah. she was on duty. She had to be in her seat. It's like, really? She was clearly <laughs> on her phone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, so I used to work one of these jobs. I don't know if you ever worked one of these jobs before or not, but I worked, um, I, I worked in a computer lab 
And so my job was to like sit in the computer lab until midnight and people would come in and do their work and leave. And I'm just supposed to sit there and make sure, I guess, they don't walk off with a computer or something, right. you know? And I mean, it was the easiest job in the world because you just sat there, talked on the phone, played video games, yeah. did your homework. But if it was like 1030 at night and there wasn't anybody in there and I was hungry. And if you, and, or if you're like, you have to go to the bathroom and if you're at the bathroom, might as well get in your car and go get pizza. Yeah, exactly. You might as well get a sandwich <laughs> or something. I'm hungry. Anyway, like, like what I said, can happen? You, you're at Amherst. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What can happen? Um, yes. And, you know, you got to get back to your room or back to your job. So maybe you're driving a little faster than you should. And so maybe you don't see the drunk guy stumbling down the road. But anyways, Thank like you. I said, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have more thoughts on this and more thoughts okay. on the uh, supposed evidence that exonerates uh, Laura it, from being it. involved. So <laughs> now one of the things that sort of cuts against this is then at 3.40 a.m., it's unclear to me whether Mara ever slept, but at 3.40 a.m., she calls Domino's for pizza delivery. Girlfriend likes pizza. What she can I say? Pizza. Yeah, I don't know. I mean... Have you ever eaten a pizza at 3.30 in the morning in college? I sure have. It's basically the best pizza. <laughs> it's, it's the most delicious pizza at yeah. the most delicious time. <laughs> it absolutely is. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe she did it every night. Maybe she did. But like I said, I don't know when she slept, if she ever slept. It seems like she was always awake. But anyway. So this puts us at the end of this strange night where Mora has this incident. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop for now. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to talk about some of the other things that happened that weekend leading up to Mora's disappearance. And there is so much more to this story. Um, so we hope you tune in tomorrow. Yeah, and like I said, I knew this was going to be a multi multi part episode, but we haven't even gotten through the story it's yet. It's just so interesting. It is so interesting. So, like we said, we've only gotten started on this case. We have a long way to go. Um, wouldn't surprise me if you guys already have questions, concerns, comments, things you want to complain about. Our contact information is prosecutorspod at gmail dot com at Prosecutors Pod for Twitter and Instagram. And then our website is prosecutorspodcast.com. So hit us up there. Let us know all the things we got wrong. I also wanted to go ahead and let you guys know about some resources you can check out if you, like we have become, if you've already become obsessed with this case. The very best thing you can do if you want to really go in depth is the Missing Maura Murray podcast by Tim and Lance. Like I said earlier, they are probably a hundred episodes into this. You don't have to listen to all hundred episodes. Frankly, if you listen to about the first, I mean, honestly, if you listen to the first 20, you probably get the whole story. It gets a little repetitive after that, but really good stuff, really in depth. Investigation Discovery did a show on Mar Murray 15 years ago. Oxygen did a six part, I believe, series in 2018, I believe. Um, really digging into this case. It's a very good Ooh. overview of what happened in the Moore Murray case. There's James Renner's book, True Crime Addict. You can check that out. And then there is the 107 Degrees podcast. Um, that podcast is Aaron Larkin's podcast. We mentioned Aaron Larkin earlier. The thing I'll say about that podcast, it's very in-depth. Um, there are things you can learn from it. Erin obviously has a very good relationship with the Murray family, and that allows her access to some information and some documents that most people just don't have. The one thing I will say about that podcast, Erin has a definite bent. Um, she has a very clear view on the Murray case that is... Well, idiosyncratic is one way to describe it. Uh, if you listen to the show, if you listen to her podcast, she is very defensive of Maura Murray. She is um, very defensive of Maura Murray's family. And there are times when that makes the show a little bit of an exercise in confirmation bias. So I would recommend learn about the case first. And then listen to her podcast. And I think that'll give you the ability to sort of cut through some of the weirdness that happens on that show. Uh, and just know going in, you will be exposed to her death struggle with James Renner. And that's just the way it is. Um, can't avoid that if you spend any time in this case. But in any event, 
we will be back with you tomorrow. Until that time, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. (laughs) I was waiting for one of us to do it. Sorry to cut in. No, no, you're fine. That's fine. See, that's that's not we're not on live radio, so that all works. Incredible mystery. That was very dramatic, by the way. I like that. Well thank you. <laughs> <laughs>